Shift knobs. I've been making a variety of these things for the past seven years, uh, selling them through my Etsy and often enjoying the gift of their popularity through the countless custom orders I've received. In fact, at the time of this video, I've made nearly 400 knobs and sold just over 300. Uh, the sales are continuing but at a slow but a steady pace. For experienced woodturners, this is not a complex project to tackle. So if you're a woodturner and you're watching this video, I, I hope I can bring some inspiration to you uh, to try your hand at this project. And for everybody else, thanks for your curiosity because I'm about to go step by step through the process of designing and turning my 400th shift knob. The project I'm documenting here is a custom order request I recently received on my Etsy. The client was specifically interested in a resin cast maple burl cap knob based on seeing some of the previous work I've done with burl cap knobs. The unique design in this kind of project rests primarily on how the resin uh, and the burl cap join together. Selecting a burl cap blank with an interesting surface in wood grain combined with using a transparent tinted or clear resin usually makes the end result all the more beautiful, sort of like looking into a snow globe or something. So careful selection and careful preparation of the materials is important. Most cuts of burl cap will have grain that is interesting enough to look at, so it's really more about the species of wood and the size of the blank that you choose that you wanna be selective about. Here in this project, the client wanted a diameter of two and a quarter inch. So I found on eBay a small maple burl blank that was advertised as two and a quarter inch in thickness. Here are two recent examples of burl cap shift knobs I've made to show you some of the varieties available to you. Uh, one is tinted transparent where I used a dye to get the resin to be a little orange and the other one is clear, but I did paint the surface of the burl cap to try to emulate a star field for a, a really cool look. There are a lot of other things you can do, including casting objects on the surface of the burl cap. So just keep in mind that uh, your imagination is really the only limit to what you can do with the, the burl cap resin combination. Okay, first things first, I'm going to need to cast this block of burl cap in some resin to get started. In order to do that, I'm going to need a mold. There's a few ways I've made molds in the past. Uh, sometimes I will use scrap plywood scrap wood and I'll make a box and I'll seal the all the cracks with caulk so that the resin doesn't leak out while it's curing but in this case I purchased myself a silicone sleeve mold that is normally made for casting soap molds but in this case uh, I'm just repurposing it for resin because silicone peels off of cured resin very easily so this is the least messy and most convenient way of casting a block of wood in resin. Okay, I've got my epoxy resin here. In this case, it's a deep pour resin, uh, which is thinner and it makes it a lot easier to mix and, as well as it seeps into all the cracks and pores of the wood that I'm casting. So I, I prefer using this kind of epoxy resin to say a tabletop epoxy resin. I've got my dye here that I was able to find on Amazon. It, it's a Kelly Green leather dye, uh, so it'll work because it's an alcohol-based dye, which works pretty good with epoxy resins. And then I'll just add it to the resin here and start stirring. One of the things I was a little disappointed is this uh, dye was not very uh, dark in color. It was pretty light, uh, barely better than clear. So I, I did go back and find another liquid dye that I had in green that was able to darken it up a bit um, but still stay in the territory of uh, what is considered to be kelly green the next step of course is to put the block of wood in the mold and pour in the resin should be obvious but one problem i did run into here was the corners were too wide on this block of wood so i did have to shave them off with a dish wheel at an angle grinder in order to 
uh, for it to have room to drop into the mold and then everything was good. Just poured the resin in on top and let it cure. Now it's time to demold and get onto the fun part, uh, putting the block on the lathe and starting to turn it. Uh, one issue I did run into for this that I had to work around was the block kept wanting to float to the top, so I wasn't able to cast it deep in the resin. And the way I fixed this was just by placing a dowel rod uh, down into the mold to push down the block all the way to the bottom. And then I just used some tape to hold that dowel rod in place. So in this case, the dowel rod was cast along with the rest of uh, the resin, but being as I'm going to cut the top of that off, it's not going to really be a factor, but it's something to consider when it comes to resin casting is it is a liquid and anything that will float uh, will attempt to float. So keep that in mind. So skipping slightly ahead, uh, I lopped off the excess resin and dowel rod and I was able to use a circle finder and a ruler to locate the center of the spindle in this case being a cylinder that it is, and I put it on the lathe and turned myself a tenon for each end so that I would be prepared to put it on my two inch chuck jaws uh, for turning instead of uh, turning it spindle-like with uh, a live center and the, the claw end. All this really means is I made it easier to mount onto the chuck of my lathe for turning. Uh, a tenon is the little thing that sticks out that is perfectly round so that the jaws can grab onto it. You see I got four jaws uh, on this chuck uh, and all a mortise is is the opposite of that. A little pocket hole for the same jaws to go into and expand out into with pressure. Uh, I find it a lot easier to do the workflow of turning shift knobs if you use a tenon on both ends rather than doing any kind of mortise method. And all I'm trying to do here is get the blank centered on the chuck so I can tighten the jaws fully down and have a good uh, alignment for when I go to drill out the pocket hole for the threading that I'm gonna do next. One of the hardest steps of the process in the past for me has always been how to mount a shift knob to the vehicle itself. Uh, if you haven't already wondered it at this point, then you have probably made a shift knob before, uh, or at least are familiar with threaded gear stick rods in vehicles. But in this case, uh, there are many lists online that will tell you what the threading of a vehicle is, uh, and everything from a Toyota Tacoma to a Ford Mustang. And I was able to find, I'll show it later in the video, I was able to find a good source for metal threadings, normally designed for replacing spark plugs, but in this case, I just repurposed them for mounting in shift knobs. So what I'm doing here is drilling out the pocket hole uh, to the diameter of the outside of the threading, and then a slightly larger hole so that it has room to sort of seat itself in there without being exposed to the bottom of the knob. And now it's time to start shaping the knob. Let's go time lapse.
find the most convenient way to address shaping the knob in finality is to get it roughly done and then skip right on to the sanding function since I have this uh, sanding pad attachment for my drill makes it a hell of a lot more convenient to uh, finalize and fi uh, sand the final shape of the knob and get it ready for finish. Uh, so that's what I've been doing here, starting with 40 grit and stepping all the way up to 220 increments at a time. And then I will clean it with isopropyl alcohol, which you can see here, uh, which gets all the sawdust off and gets it ready for the finishing process, which will be next. And now on to the fun part, the easy part, the downhill portion of this race, the finish. So I am lately been using this Vesting LED hard wax oil. It is a hard wax oil finish, which penetrates into the wood rather than being a surface finish, like a polyurethane or a lacquer. And once it soaks in, you wipe away the excess. And what makes it different from other hard wax oils is that this is a curable by a, a high-powered UV light, so in, which includes sunlight. So once you wipe away the excess, in order to cure this finish right away, you flash it with uh, an ultraviolet light that's high-powered, which uh, they sell, which is incredibly expensive, but they do sell one. But you could also put it in sunlight and it will cure. So. As far as a, a time saver goes, it's incredible. It saves me tons and tons of time waiting hours or days for a finish to dry. Uh, on top of that, it's a penetrative finish. So unlike polyurethane or lacquer, it soaks into the wood and what you end up feeling with the final product is the wood itself as opposed to the finish that's sitting on top of the wood. So uh, everybody has their preferences especially when it comes to wood turning, there's a whole world of finishing in its own, including uh, using CA glue, uh, a friction polishing, French polishing. There's a whole bunch of things. So I'm not gonna make any solid recommendations one way or another, but uh, I, I will demonstrate to you how this is the current method of finishing that I use for shifter knobs. It's what I prefer. Uh, they're not a sponsor. I'm not sponsored by any of the things that I've been using today. It's just uh, if you're curious and you've got the money to float for uh, this incredibly expensive hard wax oil and the UV light that you can also get uh, to cure it, uh, I will link uh, down below the information for it in case you want to go check it out. So uh, I, I love this product uh, and maybe you will too. Now that it's all wiped off, we are going to boom, hit it with some UV light. So now this is the curing process. All you have to do is shine the correct light on it and or put it in the sunlight and it's cured. And you can go on to do multiple coats, though only a couple are necessary, really. Slow. 
will truly take my heart. It's only time apart, and in no time we gon' be right back, right by my side like a monkey on my back. Now all that remains is to cut the knob off of its tenon, which I use this parting tool to do. And that's going to leave the bottom of the knob a little rough, so I'm going to use my sanding disc attachment with uh, a 400 grit disc on it and just clean it up real quick. Uh, I also will use some of that finish from, the, uh, from finishing the knob and do the same to the bottom so it's not bare wood anymore. But from here, it's ready to be threaded. One of the things I'm going to work to improve in future resin castings is make use of a pressure pot to eliminate all the bubbles out of this transparent resin because while this is a gorgeous knob, uh, any seeing any bubbles in a transparent resin just is it's a flaw and it's something I don't like. So that's something I'm going to try to work on in future things. And if you work with resin, you're probably already aware of that. And pretty much the final step here is to install the threading. So I'm going to take this threaded insert tap and I'm going to cut uh, threadings into the pocket hole there so that it's ready to receive this threaded insert and using some standard JB Weld a two-part uh, epoxy uh, adhesive I'm going to basically glue this threaded insert into the bottom so here I go Thank <laughs> you.